That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Blue Beetle, the third film directed by Angel Manuel Soto, which is uh, being released courtesy of Warner Brothers on August 18th, 2023. Uh, and it is the 14th uh, film in the DC Extended Universe. Do we know on Hell's other films? You know, I still haven't seen his debut, The Farm, which to me sounds really good. But we did uh, have review coverage for his 2020 title, Charm City Kings, which Meek Mill was in. Uh, oh, yeah. But I believe you didn't watch that. I was the only one covering it. That's right. Mm -hmm. The story of Blue Beetle. An alien relic chooses Jaime Reyes to be its symbolic host, bestowing the teenager with a suit of armor that's capable of extraordinary and unpredictable powers forever changing his destiny as he becomes the superhero Blue Beetle. My pull quote, surprisingly unexciting, Blue Beetle feels like an uninspired mashup of a dozen other superhero films. Which I, I, I would agree with. Um, mine is, uh, if the road to hell is paved with good intentions, so is the subway to schmaltz. Uh, the elegance of the film's emotional undercurrents are vaporized by cloying, heavy-handed storytelling. I didn't care for this movie, and I really wanted to like it, um, but I think the biggest issue is the screenplay and the story. Mm -hmm. It's written by Gareth Dunnett Alcacer, whose previous narrative uh, screenplay for Miss Bala I also didn't care for. That's a Catherine Hardwick film, but it's a remake of a much better Gerardo Naranjo uh, film. Uh, he's also uh, writing a film for Bad Bunny called El Muerto. I didn't know anything about Blue Beetle. I thought this was a Marvel movie until we sat down. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't know the history of this character. I understand that Blue Beetle's featured in some comic books periodically, but this is the first time it's in a movie. Yes, and the character of... I'm also unfamiliar, but I did read that the character of Jaime Reyes uh, in 2006 was the third character to don this... Uh, the, the mantle of Blue Beetle. The story. So the villain is Susan Sarandon. She's the head of Cord Industries. Mm -hmm. And Cord Industries does a lot of things, uh, but sort of secretly they're manufacturing weapons, specifically something called OMAC, One Man Army Corp. Mm -hmm. These are like these Robocop looking things. Very Robocop. Okay, so she has been developing this for years, but she needs the technology of the Blue Beetle, this scarab that comes from outer space. It's not explained really we, at all. We only know that it's extraterrestrial, and yeah. we don't know its methods for choosing yet. It's, it's host. Okay, so she's working on that. Jaime Reyes is this young man who's gone off to college, graduated, pre-law, we're told, and he returns home to Pol Palermo City? Mm -hmm. Okay, so his family welcomes him, and we find out that his family's going through hard times because they're going to lose their home, basically because of gentrification and the rent going up significantly. The dad has lost his business for the same reasons. He can't afford rent. But that was precipitated by the dad having a heart attack. So we learned all this in one lunch. Um, and they didn't want to bother their son while he was at college because it, it was important to them that this is the first member of their family to graduate. Right. Mm -hmm. So From when college. he returns home, they tell him and he's like, well, we'll figure something out. So we flash forward a little bit and he has not figured anything out. Uh, but he's working with his sister doing janitorial services. And we see that they're cleaning the house of Susan Sarandon. So they're not doing their job when we meet Susan's niece, Jenny, mm -hmm. played by... Runa Marquanzina plays Jenny. So Jenny's dad, Ted Cord, he has gone missing. And we'll get to him in a minute. But Jenny's the opposite of her aunt. She thinks that Cord Industries should be giving back to the community, not using it. So she and her aunt have a confrontation... And Jaime, the housekeeper, <laughs> decides that he's going to pipe up. Mm -hmm. And of course, he and his sister get fired. So while they're waiting outside for their Uber, Jenny comes out and says, you know, I'm sorry this happened to you. It's clear she finds him appealing because he is a handsome man. And she says, well, here's my phone number. Text me tomorrow. Maybe I can get you a job at like our headquarters. So the next day he shows up without an appointment. And we see that Jenny is in like the lab, 
Which we can get to all of that. But she finds this scarab, the blue beetle scarab. And we need to talk about how it was just sitting out unprotected. Well, it was locked up in Harvey Guillen's lab. Sure, but I mean, you'd have a harder time breaking into the frozen locker at McDonald's than she did getting into this lab to get this scarab that Susan Sarandon says she has spent years and like all of this time and money trying to find. And it's literally just sitting in one locked lab mm -hmm. next to like the scientist's lunchbox. Uh -huh. He has like a two piece and a biscuit box. Mm -hmm. So she grabs a scarab, puts it in this biscuit box, runs out of the building and bumps into Jaime. And he's like, hey, wait, remember me? You told me you gave me a job. And she's like, oh, you want a job? Here, take this box. Do not open it, whatever you do, and guard it with your life. So his ass takes it home. And then we've already met his family. But it, I have issues <laughs> with how the family's represented. But they're kind of like a group of like <laughs> ridiculous people led by cousin Rudy, played by Georgia Lopez, mm -hmm. who's like a crazy science, mad scientist. Of course they open the box. Like they, he's an uncle. Is he the, his uncle? Oh, yeah. he's the dad's cousin. So I guess he's the uncle of... Yeah, they keep... I'm not sure, but whatever. So uh, Jaime keeps calling him uncle. So we learn that the blue beetle scare of this alien thing has to choose its host. It's sentient. And it chooses Jaime. So we see him go through this very violent like transformation. That, that busts up their house. That tears up their house. And he turns into Blue Beetle. So, of course, now Susan's looking for him. Jenny comes. Jenny says, well, I can... Well, he goes to find Jenny because there's something traumatic has happened. He's like, I need this taken out of my body. So she's the only one that can give me answers. And she's like, you need the key. They go get the key. They learn a bunch of stuff. But, <laughs> well, just to wrap it up. Sure. Susan Sarandon does end up um, kidnapping Jaime. Because the Blue Beetle, she needs it back, but it's like embedded in him. Mm -hmm. So the only way to get it out of him is to basically download all this code from the Beetle. I thought that was weird. And then, of course, it's going to kill Jaime. But Jenny's dad, Ted Cord, he's like the original Blue Beetle. And he had a lab, like in the family mansion. So that's where they end up. And they, he still has all his technology there, like his Blue Beetle Batmobile. But it's like uh, analog technology because Blue Beetle never chose him. So he had to create his own. But it's mm -hmm. effect. It's, I mean, it's like, Bat, it, well, they even reference Batman. Like yeah. it's a low budget Batman. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has a very retro vibe. You're going to get to the soundtrack. But anyway, the family, which I think should have been the story, which we can get to. But the family, like grandma, mom. Rudy uh, and Jenny and the sister all go to save Jaime. The dad has died from a heart attack. They are effective somewhat in rescuing him. But there's a final showdown between Susan Sarandon has a henchman named... Carapax mm -hmm. is his, uh, the name she chose for him. Uh, played by uh, Raul Max Trio, who is a very notable... Uh, character actor. He's been in Apocalypto. He's in Malik's The New World. You've seen him in things. He's donning one of these Omax suits, which now that she has the code from the Blue Beetle, he's basically as strong as the Blue Beetle. But of course, the Blue Beetle defeats him. And then all of that code, which we're told by Susan Sarandon's character, is everything she's worked for. Like the code that's in this one external hard drive. It's not uploaded to a cloud or anything. Everything that's in her hand, this is all she ever needed. And of course, as you would predict, that gets destroyed. And then we see that the bad guy, uh, whatever his name is. Carapax. It would appear that he has killed Susan Sarandon. Mm -hmm. Which I'm guessing his name is supposed to be uh, like the word carapace for the hard shell of a, like an arachnid or a crustacean. So he's like an empty shell. Oh. <laughs> and then, of course, all's well that ends well. Jenny and Jaime spark a romance. The court industries is now run by Jenny. So, of course, she's going to pay to have their family home not only rebuilt, but they're going to give the area that we're saying all of these disenfranchised people live in that are who, who like the area is being gentrified. It's called the Keys. Mm -hmm. She's saying the that edge keys, the edge keys court industry is going to give back all of that land to the people. And then the post credit scene, we see that. We were told that Jenny's dad, Ted Cord, the original Blue Beetle, was dead. Well, somebody does say he disappeared. Or disappeared yeah. and they can't find him years and years ago. But he transmits a message saying, I'm not dead. Or Ted Cord's not dead. Tell Jenny. Mm -hmm. The end. Um, oh, it was just, you know, these like 
<clears throat> these superhero movies where it's like the first one and we're introduced to being or being introduced to this character, which is what this film is. I think this one is probably one of the worst. To me, this was on the level of like Morbius or <laughs> it's just like Oh, I think it's better than that. I don't know. I was more entertained by Morbius. I just I just hated the way this character is presented. I think that there was a better story within. If you watch the trailer, what's the most fun part of the trailer? The grandma with it, the machine gun. He, that was Adriana Barraza, who's she, uh, the Oscar nominee from Babel, who we just reviewed in Monica as well. She's the best part of the trailer. And then in the theater, I thought, oh, this is really funny because we find out her character used to be a revolutionary. And that's why she's handy with a an, an armed or with a firearm. So... I don't understand why we didn't focus more on this family and them finding the Blue Beetle's old technology and they use that to take down a nefarious entity that's maybe trying to like, you know, oppress people. To me, that would have been the better story, but instead we spent over an hour with Jaime and he to me is like the most annoying version of like a Peter Parker because he's a college graduate who I'm assuming because he studied pre-law was going to go to law school. So he should be a very assertive, articulate young man. And he just seems like a bumbling high schooler. He, do, it, he does seem more high school than uh, a college graduate. But I think there should have been, and it should have been reflected in the screenplay, of, of him grappling with uh, his assertiveness, I think. Because you do see that from the moment where he sacrifices his job, he's been taught that he needs to do the right thing, even if it is a consequence to himself. And that is, I think how we're supposed to read into the Blue Beetle choosing him as like a, almost kind of an innocent, but uh, it, it doesn't do a good job of uh, uh, coordinating that in any other way. I'm just going to go through my notes. So the sister Milagro, she's played by... Belissa Escobedo, who we've seen in Hocus Pocus 2. Uh, every time they say her name, I kept thinking, I've never seen the Milagro Beanfield War. <laughs> that was my go-to. Noted. <laughs> she had a strong start. She has some pretty funny lines... Uh... Early, early on. on because you know they haven't told Jaime that they're losing the family home the dad had a heart attack he's lost his business so it's at lunch that Milagros finally like we have something to tell you and then she kind of just spits it out and then they're going so now everyone knows about their financial troubles and they're talking about how Jaime is you know the first one in the family to go to college and then she goes yeah the first and the last one to go to college <laughs> And then when we get to their job in the future sometime, cleaning Susan Sarandon's house, we see that like her patio furniture, like underneath is covered with like someone stuck a bunch of gum underneath. And immediately I'm like, immediately I think, what kind of rich people would be Are so tacky yeah. to put gum under this expensive furniture? And then we find out it's Milagro doing it and she's like, oh, for job security. That was the energy I liked from her. But then after that, it just sort of becomes like she's... There's not much to her character. And the same with the rest of the family. Except yeah. for George Lopez. Yeah. Um, this whole one-man army court business, I feel like... It's very Robocop to me. And we never get an explanation of the scarab. And the opening scene is Susan Sarandon going to like some site like some dig site where they have found this huge boulder and they're digging in it because they believe the scarab's in there. But we're told by one of the scientists played by Harvey Guillen that, you know, we've done this many times before and we were wrong. So don't, you know, don't get too excited. And she's like, no, I know that it's in there. And then we cut to Jaime returning home. So we don't learn that she actually found it until Jenny walks into the lab and grabs it. I just thought that was so weak that something that was so important to the plot just gets kind of like, meh, there it is. And we don't know what it does. And it's this alien entity, but it has code that you can download. Mm -hmm. Like I'm downloading a extension to my Chromebook. Well, like, it's, an, I mean, it's an alien entity that's voiced by pop star Becky G. But this, it, start, it sounds like some straight up AI. I don't even know why they needed... I don't, they just should just coded that dialogue for a robot to read. And that alien's name is Kajida. Mm -hmm. So, I'd, like, and we only know that because Jaime is saying, oh, I feel it in my mind and it's like I can talk to it and I know its name is Kajida. I thought the voice of this thing was so annoying. I'm sorry. I just, it was so annoying because it's kind of, it's like robotic, but it's sentient. So it kind of has a little bit of an attitude. And then the whole M.O. 
of Kajida is to protect its organic host, right? Because it needs it to persist. So we see that it can take over and like execute whatever it needs to do perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. But then sometimes it just lets him fail. And then sometimes it says, I recommend you do this. I don't advise that. But then sometimes it overrides him. If the goal of this alien is self-preservation, why do you give this thing, this stupid boy any options? <laughs> well, also, why aren't you explaining to him how, how this is supposed to work? Or that. Because we spend a lot of time with him kind of fumbling through it instead of... Like, the first time that he puts it on, I, I'll, I'll be it, you know, they haven't uh, become symbiotic by then. I don't know, you brought up a good point, as in the voice work of Venom, I think, is makes for a much more entertaining character <laughs> character work than this. Because in, Ven because in this movie, Kaji does... Uh, voice which only he can hear is very disruptive mm -hmm. every time it was talking I felt like it was like it, like if I were in the movie and someone's sitting next to me talking mm -hmm. versus Venom Venom feels like a character so it was kind of like well integrated into well there's a dialogue yeah there's almost. a dialogue mm -hmm. so I found it very disruptive I do want to say uh, Milagro had another funny line when Jenny is talking to Jaime after he gets fired <laughs> Milagro goes, oh, do you need any pre-lawyers? Because yeah. he, he has a pre-law degree. <laughs> well, I thought it was entertaining that she thought she deserved a luxury dump as well. Oh, that's right, because she's like a servant, so mm -hmm. they have servants' facilities. And she's like, no, I deserve a luxury dump today. So she uses like a main bathroom in the house. Mm -hmm. So her, she was funny in the beginning. Um, yeah, again, why did Jaime, what did he go to college for if he doesn't understand anything? Well, he that he will need to continue his education. Yeah, but he talks about everything he doesn't know, understand. Even at the, I guess I can get to it now. I also didn't like how this family was represented because as I was sitting in the audience and like people were laughing at certain things, it very much felt to me like hearing Dave Chappelle talk about why he quit doing the Chappelle show because he felt like people were laughing at him and not like with him. And I just think like this, you know, family is sort of made to seem ridiculous. And I think there were moments when they were doing things that were silly that people were laughing at, like, oh, you're so stupid. That bothered me. Like in the beginning at lunch, when they're explaining their financial problems and the bill comes and, you know, they don't have any money and the dad tips more than 20%. And the mom says, you know, maybe we shouldn't do that. And the dad's like, well, we don't, let's not think about money until tomorrow. And it's like, well, that's kind of why you're in this predicament problem. I don't know. Sure, but it's also meant to show that that dad's um, through line is that we will always overcome because we've, we've figured out worse things. Yeah, but I, I, I guess I wanted this to feel more like... I don't know, like a more proud representation of these people and how they've worked hard and circumstances beyond their control have brought them to this situation they're in today. But the way this movie plays out is like, they just seem kind of like irresponsible chaotic. And, and chaotic. And then Rudy, George Lopez, we haven't even talked about, is like, he's funny. And I do like George Lopez. He is funny, mm -hmm. but he's ridiculous. And then you have the mom who has nothing to do, the grandma who has nothing to do except in the end. And yes, and these are all notable uh, actors. Elpidio Carrillo, who's the mother, was in Predator. Yeah. Of course. And the dad, um, Damien Alcazar, he's been around a, a ton of stuff. And I, you know, like The Crime of Padre Amaro is a big one. I highly recommend it. It, it was got no play here because it's a foreign film. But in 2015, he's the lead role in this film called Magallanes. Really heavy, hard-hitting film. He's excellent. I think people could, you know, because you see four adults living in this little house and you think like four of y'all couldn't pay the bills, but then there's more to it because at a point we understand that perhaps two of them are undocumented. So there are reasons behind why this family has really struggled to transcend their situation so like i can read into that and see it but i'm just concerned that other people might look at it and be like oh this like silly irresponsible immigrant family and their stupid son who graduated college and then all the this he really doesn't i don't even think in the end he seems like he's <laughs> like a bright guy 
I don't, the, I think one of this film's major crimes is how it delivers exposition uh, and then completely ignores those fine tunings I think we need for the family dynamic because I, I believe that uh, Uncle Rudy says that uh, the grandmother and the father are undocumented. But then the next inevitable question is, is he not married to the mother? Uh, how does that look? like? It's, it's like we want more information about this family and we want to understand. And then if you compare them to something like uh, another family in a comic book universe who's given a pretend city and a place of power is the Black Panther films. And yeah. how we have this African city that um, is powerful and responsible and I guess the American equivalent for uh, Mexican-American families is this city, which I don't... Not that it has to correlate, but it's just curious the choices that were made. It is curious. I was a little confused. When we first get to Palermo City, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. I thought we were in like South America. And then when I found out we were in the United States, I was like surprised. And then it's a Mexican-American family, but we look like we're in Miami. And then they're calling it the Keys. I it I was not well. I, like, like I felt a little disoriented. Sure. Um, I Oh, go ahead. And I think there's just a more elegant way to show how terrible white people can be. Because um, when Jaime goes to meet Jenny at her downtown office building, the white secretary mispronounces his name, even though she's not looking at it. Which I think when when white people say "see Jaime" written down, they say Jamie because they're not they're they're just not it's not computing to them. Well, yeah, I was hoping that because we get that we get. Um... Susan Sarandon is very problematic because she, even like her main scientist uh, played by Harvey Guillen, she keeps calling him Sanchez and that's not his name. And in the end, he finally like snaps on her, but she treats, cause even when she fires, uh, the two, when she fires Jaime and Malagro, she says something to the effect of like, um, she makes some sort of like racial comment towards them. So she makes it when the scene that bothered me, that got me emotional was when we see that they, Susan Shrana tries to kidnap his family. And that's when the dad dies of, has you can read a lot into that but about migrant. Yeah. She's in the helicopter saying, gather them up. Yes. Yes. So I like, I like, I guess I wanted to feel more like, mm, like this family fighting against this entity that symbolizes something bigger than just court industries. But what it ended up feeling like is just a silly movie about a, a beetle. And, and then, so then we get the segment where they find Blue Beetle's like retro lab and all of his old, you know, his old airplane and his weapons. And they use that to try to save Jaime in the end. And then that's where we get a lot of this retro music that I really, really liked. Mm -hmm. The Hacks and Cloak, uh, who's done, who did the uh, soundtrack for Midsummer, it, it's giving a very '80s Tangerine Dream vibe, which I I think my favorite element of the film was the soundtrack. Yes, and that's what made me really long for, or you know, when I, I, I really would have loved more time with this family fighting against, and then maybe Jaime doesn't even turn into the Blue Beetle until the end. Because we spent a long time with him just kind of fumbling around with this thing inside of him. Mm -hmm. Even when they get to Jenny and her dad's old mansion where the lab is, when they first get there, Rudy's with them, George Lopez, who I don't think we mentioned is like a very smart man who is like understands technology. He builds things. Mm -hmm. He's actually, it's his technology that allows them to break into court industries to steal the key to get into this mansion. But when they get there, Jaime gets upset at a point when he's told that you can never get this beetle out of you and he runs away. And Rudy goes, oh, I know where he went. You and then he goes up to the roof and I was like, how did Rudy know that Jaime would be on the roof of this enormous mansion that he's never been to? And he just walks up some stairs and he's like, oh yeah, there he is. Mm -hmm. Like a cat, he says. Uh, yeah, the, again, that's where the, the there's not a lot of elegance, I think, in this. Well, also, script. how did Rudy know how to operate the Blue Beetle's equipment? Like everything is just like so intuitive. There's a point where he has like the fart, the this big bug farts, bug or? farts, this big well spaceship essentially that has a mechanism that is a bug fart that they can spray on everybody. That I thought was ridiculous. Um, but Susan Sarandon is very. Uh, 
like an elementary villain. And it was supposed to be Sharon Stone initially. Well, at one point in the movie, they refer to her, one of the characters goes, uh, I think it's Malagra. She goes, look at her. She's giving Cruella DeVille mixed with the Kardashians. And I thought, no, she's not. Maybe Sharon Stone could have done that. Yes. But Susan's just like... She's too gung-ho. She's too over the top. And that makes her so easy to hate when something more insidious, I think, would have been more appropriate. Like her trying to, you know, superficially trying to foster her niece's uh, position in the company, like mentor her, but really like planning to kill her or something. Susan Sarandon seemed like all white lady in like Newport Beach at a Blue Bottle Cafe complaining about the line taking too long. Basically. That's how she just, all she was doing was like shouting like grievances and orders. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. and it, and then Harvey Guillen, I think is interesting because his position is like a race trader for his allegiance to her. And it really comes through when Jaime is kidnapped. He's like begging him. He's like, oh, gee, I'm sorry. And then he, um, for some redemption, he frees Jaime, but then it costs him his life. And we get a flashback of how he was, he came to know Susan and we see that she kidnapped him from Guatemala Mm -hmm. and his family was murdered, probably in due part to her doings. I thought that was... How it's introduced is corny, but it is... It's it's, powerful, but then again, I wanted the story to be more about like these people fighting against the entity that's oppressing them Mm -hmm. or manipulating them. And... It, it doesn't feel like that. And I think the lack of catharsis with the Sarandon character is she, do, she doesn't even, it doesn't even register to her really what she's done. No, not even until the end, because in the end she says like, oh, because then there's also this weird, like, I almost got the sense that she's like attracted to him and like maybe they maybe did have a romance at one point. I mean, <laughs> Again, if this had been a film actually made for adults, we could have explored those themes. And I think that's what the major folly of this film is. There is, this, there is great power in this representation, but it also seems like it, it's geared towards children. I know people are going to hate this review. What would you give it, the Um, movie? I would give it two out of five. Uh, Unfortunately, I would give it two out of five. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.